This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Explorers have found life in the deepest, driest, darkest, hottest, and coldest corners of our planet. As resilient as life seems to harsh environments, maybe we might find some in space, and if not, maybe we can make some. In this episode, we're going to talk about life forms in space, specifically about evolutionary pathways that could lead to life forms that can live there. We will explore more artificial or designed life in future episodes, starting with space whales and bioships this Thursday. At first glance, life evolving in space seems implausible. We tend to think of space as a cold, lifeless vacuum or perhaps a blazing hot, lethally irradiated, lifeless vacuum. But we've always been tentative about the lifeless part, because life has surprised us in many environments. Extraterrestrial life of even the crudest forms would conform some important theories about how life originated, and it would create a new zeal for searching all the remote corners of our solar system for critters hiding under the ice, in rocky crags, and among the clouds. I should make a distinction right up front between life originating in a place and adapting to that place. Life can adapt to harsh environments it probably could never have formed in, and any life that might exist in space would almost certainly have started its evolution in a more protected environment and adapted to space later. Indeed, as we discussed in our look at the panspermia theory of life originating in space and coming to Earth, One might argue that planets, serving as an incubator for life, whether it originated there or not, are where it develops before emerging from those cocoons to spread across space. The panspermia theory, even if true, which it probably is not, still only suggests simple life emerged off planets and seeded them, and for today we'll look at how simple life originating in the void might develop into something more complex and diverse. As of now, we have no evidence of life anywhere off Earth, though an assumption of its absence in this solar system is premature, because at this point we've just barely begun to explore the bodies nearest us. Mars seems like a good prospect because it has the right ingredients and most likely environment to host, or at least have hosted, primordial life, as it may have been friendlier to life in the past. But even on Mars we've only done fairly simple biocentral tests and only in a few spots. The Moon and Mars are the only bodies we've checked even that carefully. While a developed civilization orbiting a distant star would leave traces we could identify from light years away, we might at best detect non-technological life around other stars by atmospheric signatures and living things smaller than a forest are difficult to detect even from a Galileo or Cassini probe orbiting above. We might not even know if we were looking at life either. As we've said elsewhere, intelligence recognizes intelligence, but it would be very easy to mistake a patch of simple lichen absorbed from orbit that was sprawling over a continent-sized patch of ice as some type of impact dust crater or mundane geological phenomena. We also have to keep in mind, as we get further from the Sun or visit worlds without thick atmospheres, that any such life is likely to be hidden below and might be quite peculiar. Science fiction's portrayals of creatures on other planets are sometimes plausible and sometimes not, but the popular visions of life that might exist elsewhere in space are generally fantastical. Space whales or leviathons are a popular trope as they are natural extensions of the space is an ocean trope that pervades sci-fi, but I'm sure I don't need to tell most fans of this channel that a whale would fail poorly in space. Tails only work for propulsion when you're in a viscous medium like water, and the same goes for maneuvering fins, and of course, hauntingly beautiful whale songs are right out when there's no medium to carry the sound. However, if a large creature lived in orbit above a planet, there would be good reasons for it to have distinct dorsal and ventral sides. There is no up or down in space until you get near a planet. If food or threats usually came from either above or below, it would make sense for the animal's sensors to be mostly on that side. 
It would also be advantageous to be colored something like an inverse orca, with a dark belly that blends into the sky above, and a dorsal surface colored like the surface below. But could big creatures really somehow exist in space? Certainly not by themselves. No creature can exist without an entire supporting ecosystem around them, with the exception of Boltzmann brains or arguably a hive mind. Whales can't live anywhere unless there's plankton, krill, or fish around for them to eat, and the same goes for their analogs in space. So instead of individual space creatures, we need to think about how an ecology could be established in space, a void ecology. And by the way, I'll often describe creatures by the names of their counterparts on Earth, not because I expect space creatures to look much like Earth ones, but because they would very likely occupy analogous ecological niches. In any environment that's constantly likened to an ocean, the apex predator deserves to be called a shark. But let's back up an eon or two, because life has to exist first before it can evolve into whales and sharks. Earth life probably formed in the protected environment of the oceans, where it could perform vast numbers of delicate experiments in RNA and DNA self-replication in a relatively stable temperature range and safe from ionizing radiation above. The first life forms existed exclusively in the oceans for eons before they ventured anywhere else. This is an important principle to understand, that while life can thrive in diverse environments, it does need a somewhat sheltered environment in which to form in the first place, and it needs to evolve to at least a certain extent and have certain mechanisms well established before it's ready to venture out. Probably the most life-friendly regions of space besides planetary surfaces would be the rings of a large planet like Saturn, but perhaps one closer to its Sun than Saturn is. Though the geothermal energy and tidal forces near such planets might be sufficient initially, just as they likely were on Earth before we had photosynthesis, in among those rocks and ice chunks are an abundance of compounds containing the necessary elements for life. The cavities and craggy surfaces of small natural satellites also offers a fine physical environment for life, plenty of rough surface area for photosynthetic creatures to anchor themselves to and caverns insulated from the radiation and the extremes of temperature fluctuations. The one problem life would not have in space is finding enough energy. Photosynthesis is certainly an option, as are any number of chemical processes, and we have found radiotrophic fungi in and around nuclear facilities. With the entire EM spectrum available in raw sunlight, any number of photochemical processes could be used to convert EM energy from different bands into storable chemical energy. Nor should we rule out more photovoltaic approaches, the conversion of light into electricity rather than chemical energy. The role of oxygen in Earth's history illustrates an important principle in understanding evolution. Oxygen is sometimes poorly described as a waste product, but evolution is not very tolerant of waste, so releasing O2 wouldn't have continued for very long unless it conferred some survival advantage on the organisms doing it. Oxygen is highly caustic and destructive to most organic molecules. The very first algal cells that released oxygen into their primordial ponds were probably harmed by it, but they were quickly naturally selected for their ability to tolerate it. Those that adapted to oxygen gained a major survival advantage over their neighbors, whom they had poisoned. Of course those neighbors were also soon naturally selected for their ability to tolerate oxygen and eventually for their ability to use it. Oxygen does another neat trick that was rather convenient for the evolution of life on Earth. When diatomic O2 is exposed to UV radiation, it turns into triatomic O3, ozone, which blocks UV radiation. When enough of it is built up in the primordial atmosphere, it shielded the proto-life below, enabling it to evolve into more complex, delicate molecular forms that couldn't have withstood all the UV. Similarly, many creatures evolved to keep a layer of dead skin around them as a protective layer of armor, another example of waste being repurposed into a useful role. So we've established that primordial life needs a somewhat sheltered environment to form and incubate in before it's ready to venture out and adapt to harsher environments. 
caverns inside of ice clumps in a planetary ring might be an adequate nursery for more complex life forms to emerge from, but if not, it is also possible for life to form first on planets then migrate into space. As we discussed in our look at Panspermia, it appears possible for microbladen rocks to be ejected into space and survive to land elsewhere, indeed we also discussed how it might develop on a simple icy comet. How likely they are to survive and adapt on landing on a new world depends on how well their previous environment prepared them, but if the destination is unpopulated, at the very least, they will experience no competition. Tardigrades, moss, and lichen have all been found well above the 20,000 foot or the 6 kilometer mark in the Himalayas, and bacteria and algae have been found in clouds as high as 10 miles up. It's entirely possible that under the right circumstances, and with more available biomass, those ragged fringes of our biosphere could gradually adapt to live in vacuum, indeed we found bacteria living on the outside of our space station. Something like this could easily happen on a dwarf planet with mountains that rise above the atmosphere. Large rocky plants tend to pull tall mountains down, but small ones can have huge mountains and thin atmospheres, both in height and pressure. A body with small oceans in which to incubate life, and mountains that life can climb to adapt to vacuum and gamma rays might be the ideal cradle for life awaiting a meteor to knock them into space. Planets can also slowly lose their atmospheres and magnetospheres, and this happens on geological timelines, potentially quite sufficient for evolution to adapt to. Nor is a meteor impact the only way for microbes to reach orbit from the surface. Many planets and moons have volcanoes or cryovolcanoes that eject material into orbit. Indeed it's quite probable that on small double dwarf planets like Pluto and Charon that matter is regularly exchanged this way and more volcanic moons like Jupiter's Io might easily spread matter to their sibling moons and rings. And that brings us back to our most likely habitat for life in space, the rings of a planet. Once a variety of microbes are established there and thriving on the available ammonia and organics, they can form an ecology and evolve into all the ecological niches. And the great thing about space is that if your species is not genetically diverse, the radiation will make you so. Wherever some creature is creating chemical energy from sunlight, some other creature is going to evolve to just take that chemical energy instead of creating its own, and the predator-prey evolutionary race is on. So if some microbes evolve to live in space, like lichen or moss, there's an ecological niche available for something that eats them and advantage to that creature if it is mobile and can handle travel in a vacuum, same for the spores of that space moss. Same too, we might see fairly sophisticated coral emerge, as it's quite easy to encapsulate and reshape even entire asteroids and icebergs when there's little gravity or typical erosion forces constraining you. One might even imagine them slowly hollowing such places out and expanding them like big balloons, for more sunlight and perhaps creating pockets of gases or liquids inside such reef structures or even entire pressurized bubbles spawning a new interior ecology. One other reason planetary rings might be the preferred environment rather than larger belts around a star like the Kuiper Belt or the Asteroid Belt is their density. Planetary rings have shepherd moons that capture escaping material and bounce or fling it back inward, keeping the rings dense with raw material and habitats. Distance is less relevant in space, with no water or air requiring constant effort to push against when traveling, but hardly something we can ignore either, and in such rings the closest objects are separated by mere kilometers, not many thousands of them. So you could have creatures not only spread out, but even migrate to graze new areas. It's also important that the dense collection of orbiting bodies offers an archipelago of habitats that are somewhat isolated from one another, but reachable with some luck and effort. Collisions between ring objects will knock pieces off and create opportunities for creatures that have evolved successfully to migrate all around the ring, something akin to rapid continental drift. Cycles of isolation and contact are important for evolution because they drive diversity and adaptability. 
In times of isolation, distinct evolutionary paths are explored separately, to be tested against each other later in times of mixing and contact. Waiting for the rock you're on to get bumped by another is obviously not the only way to get around space. There's no classic wind or sea currents in space, but you can still release spores although you'll need to give them a push to set them adrift, or provide them some means of locomotion. And it won't only be spores drifting about in hopes of finding a fertile new home, chances are, any creatures living in space will need to be able to endure long periods of scarcity and the best survival strategy for that is dormancy or migration. On Earth, lungfish survive summer droughts by estivating, which is basically hibernating but in the summer. A creature who has exhausted his food on one rock might find that his best bet is to jump off into the void and go to sleep until colliding with a new habitat. Hibernation is always a high-risk survival path, a last resort, and migration is better, but one must begin with baby steps, even where migration is possible, and one big difference from Earth, in space, one is likely to go dormant while migrating. So some creatures will simply gather solar energy and become active only when they encounter a wisp of methane or ammonia or detritus to consume then go back to their semi-dormancy until they encounter the next. At this point, they've essentially evolved into space plankton, albeit in an ocean less nutrient-dense than Earth's. With all these spores, eggs, plankton, and sleepers drifting around, our space ecology has a well-established bottom level, and there are wide-open evolutionary niches for herbivores, insectivores, small predators, bigger predators, and yes, majestic leviathons that drift gracefully about, capturing krill and plankton. There are advantages for size and for storing materials for the journey. More size means thicker skin for shielding, via the square cube law, same as we discussed for spaceship armor. Used up resources might be expelled as gas or solids to provide proportion. For the sake of good taste, we won't explore the Delta V available from strategic use of bodily waste, but it's not minimal, especially in the context of a planetary ring environment. Moreover, a thick skin need not always be massed together. One might imagine an organism developing quite large wings or fins to approximate solar or magnetic sails, which can be folded to protect against radiation as well. This also offers energy and proportion without losing matter, which is important as there's plenty of energy to be collected while floating in space, it's only matter that is scarce. We might also imagine that it might develop some internal equivalent of a weak ion drive. One might imagine methane and oxygen-based bio-rockets as well, but it's critical to remember that high thrust won't be very important unless dealing with a moon or asteroid with an escape velocity of at least hundreds of meters a second, which while small compared to Earth's gravity well, is something you'd find on only the few hundred most massive objects in a solar system, not the millions of smaller bodies. Of course you're quite likely to encounter such bodies and be dragged down onto them, which is a nice place to get stranded at least. You might also find organisms that dwelt in orbit of such places, waiting for other life to drift in and be captured by the gravity well, or an organism that entirely takes over a large rock, like a big space crab, waiting for things to fall down onto it. But if you're a rock-clinging creature who happens to get stranded on the surface of a big space crab or whale, you might find that's a life worth adapting to, living in a place that predators steer clear of, always near a food source. Our space leviathons might soon find themselves covered in barnacles, moss, and remoras, and that they've quite unwillingly become mini-ecosystems themselves. There too, we mentioned coal earlier, and them developing colonies over an entire rock and even turning it into something like a big balloon body, and this too might be an avenue for a space whale. Those space whales might interact with weak but significant gravity wells, those with several meters per second of escape velocity, by lowering down a tentacle or long tongue, saves it delta V or damage by litho breaking, which is to say, crashing into the object to slow down. So our space whale, which we noted might have huge thin sails for wings rather than fins, might also look more like a giant space squid, 
Indeed these things could conceivably get big enough to have their own noticeable gravity well, especially ones that evolved into a niche for expanding out beyond those planetary rings and moons, either down to a planet or off to distant Trojan asteroids of that planet. As the whale's shape is met more for buoyancy, such space leviathons might start skimming gas giants and evolve to more of that big balloon whale-like shape complete with fins, or maybe one that didn't live in the upper atmospheres of gas giants but just dove down to grab gases. Neat notion, but before we get too carried away imagining designs for a bioship, we need to remember some things about how natural selection works and how it develops solutions to problems. We often speak figuratively about evolution developing certain adaptations for a certain purpose, but it really doesn't work like an industrial design process. The evolution of the car or airplane is a textbook example of intelligent design, not natural selection. Natural selection is a process by which small changes incrementally either improve or diminish a creature's ability to survive and reproduce, there are no other goals or purposes. Every incremental change needs to bring about a survival advantage for that generation, so while we can picture how to make a rocket, fuel, and oxidizer organically, in nature those parts have to come about in an unplanned way each of them having enhanced the creature's survival in some way before they came together as full-fledged rocket or solar sails or magnetic sails. And while it is plausible to chart a pathway for storing gas and expelling it as a weak rocket, or developing small thin protrusions initially to allow change of attitude then to grow to act as solar sail wings, We can't just assume some space leviathan is going to evolve a high power source like a fusion drive that would let us contemplate using such a creature as a genuine spaceship. But here we can start bringing intelligent design into things, because while we can imagine life possibly evolving along these lines, indeed maybe even to enormous complexity, diversity, and size, What we can do with intentional design, via genetic engineering or blowing the lines between the biological and machine, alters things enormously. We will be exploring this idea this summer, and we will begin this Thursday with a look at space whales and bioships, and we'll begin seeing just what amazing options we have for void ecology once we bring technology into play and blur the lines between life and machine. But while such a thing occurring naturally would seem fairly improbable, maybe it's not too improbable, and the Universe is a big place, so perhaps somewhere there is a large and diverse natural void ecology. While I generally write the episodes here and others help edit them, sometimes an episode is also co-written by one of our editors, and today's episode and our follow-up on Thursday were co-written by Jerry Gorn, and of course I wanted to thank him for that, but I also wanted to mention that he's recently released an anthology, Purple Dreams, a collection of sci-fi and fantasy short stories, one of which is about the ecology of the void, and I talked him into recording that, and it's up on his new YouTube channel if you'd like to give that a listen. You can also read a short story about the topic of Thursday's episode, The Perilous Lives of Bioships, in the free preview window of his Amazon page. You'll find both of those linked in the video description. Quite a few of the folks who help write and edit episodes here on SFIA are authors as is a fair amount of the audience, and that can vary from a fun hobby to a serious profession, but it does take a lot of skill and practice, and while everyone's style and medium is different, a lot of those skills overlap and there is no point reinventing the wheel. For a fiction writer, be it modern fiction, fantasy, or science fiction, Ultimately, everything is about the characters, and there's an excellent course on Storytelling 101 by urban fantasy author Daniel Jose Ordor that helps go over the basics of characters, conflicts, contexts, and storytelling that can help you sharpen your skills and avoid a lot of the mistakes folks make when first working on a story. Skillshare has a ton of other videos on writing too, as well as many other creative or hands-on skills, from drawing and animating to computer programming and how to fix a car. A premium membership gives you unlimited access to over 20,000 high-quality classes on must-know topics, 
so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my listeners, get 2 months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, visit the link in the description and the first 500 visitors get 2 months of unlimited access to over 20,000 classes for free. Act now for this special offer and start learning today. We have a busy schedule for the rest of the month, in addition to today's bonus episode we have our regular Thursday episode which as I've mentioned is a companion piece to today's, on space whales and bioships, then a week from today we have another bonus episode, or two of them, as we team up with Jade from Up and Atom to look at the concept of a Boltzmann brain, a randomly assembled mind, and what the Anthropic Principle tells us about the probability they might exist or that we ourselves might be an example of one. We will then finish out the month with a return to the Alien Civilization series to look at possible alien invasion scenarios and motivations, from overt attack to infiltration, in Invasive Aliens, before doing our monthly Q&A session. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, please like it and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.